the uh, December 25th, and uh, I'm going to be working on the um, only the second drawing depicting a uh, religious Orthodox Jewish person murdered by the Nazis during the uh, Holocaust. Nazi occupied Europe, World War II. This is the uh, photograph, which I'll talk about later. Rather a uh, astonishing image. And I prepared a uh, good size, my first large size work in at least a couple of years. Yeah, about the same height as me, about 5'9", my height, and uh, I just began the uh, pencil underlay here of the figure through his right arm on the viewer's left, his head, his uh, left arm hasn't been drawn yet, <coughs> and I'm going to do a gouache or metallic ink underlay for the uh, stripes in the talit, the prayer show, which will mainly be around here. That's it. To be continued. Come on. See. So, my question again is, I was asking about the line across the chin uh, barbed, barbed of that wire. man, and you said it's yeah. barbed wire. I was just saying it was not easy for me to tell uh -huh. that it was barbed wire. Right. I don't know actually how important that is to you, except that it cuts a line right across his lips. Right, and there'll be another one down here. So I think you asked if this is going to extend out over here and here. I wondered. So my idea for this piece right now is to notice uh, this kind of rectilinear shape I've made going around like that, 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 that. Yes. And then I'll actually continue over here. Sure. Uh, and then down here like this. What I was thinking of doing is cutting this out, making it oh. into a shaped piece. Mm -hmm. Same way, why don't you um, turn mm -hmm. that over to the sure. uh, young man with Sarah David. Oh, of course. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, see how that's shaped. Anyway. <coughs> and it's uh, Monday evening. Uh, January 31st, working on this uh, section here. I've uh, turned the drawing upside down so as to uh, be able to work in these uh, bottom sections here. Over this is the lower left, which I'm drawing there. And from the uh, this uh, broken uh, Jewish gravestone in Poland from the time of the stone in the book. Thursday, October 6th, so when my neighbor Steve Ouch was here the other day, um, he said he liked the uh, prayer shawl kind of uh, under the barbed wire, and I asked what he meant, and he 
said Rob Letter was kind of was there on the right and there on the left and also in the drawing and he said he liked the way it enveloped the piece so I'm thinking of right now these aren't glued down the uh, two bowls I bought with all the blue stripes so I've set this all here at the bottom and above his head um, in synagogue, especially at high holidays, you can see people who totally wrap their whole bodies and their entire head covered with the talit, the prayer shawl. So uh, that's also not glued down up there. And I guess I would probably intersperse it with white anyway. Uh, I guess we'll see what happens. And I put a little bit above the uh, section of Talit on the left, same on the right there. That's the story. Onward. Everybody have a great uh, <clears throat> Wednesday, early evening, October 5th here. So, uh, I am uh, made some decisions here as to how to finish the piece here. So, um, I decided to continue in a different style than how I did the talit, the prayer shawl at center right and center left but uh, kind of down here at the bottom uh, I broke apart a uh, bowl I bought at uh, Goodwill a couple nights ago it had like blue and white patterning on it and um, I think I'm going to continue some of that using this here. Actually, I really like this bowl. I could see eating breakfast or dinner out of this or lunch, but it's going to meet the wrecking ball in a second here. And um, uh, I'm going to put some blue sky up there, probably in there using a variety of different broken bowls, plates, what have you, of blue and uh, some decorative patterning from a synagogue wall will go in the upper left there. And, as Pete Seeger sang, if I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the morning, I'd hammer in the evening, all over this land, I'd hammer for, I don't remember the words, I'm going to make them up, justice. I'm hammering for freedom. I'm hammered for my brothers and sisters and da 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 ba da 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 all over this land. Ooh, it's resistant. Ooh, ouch. <laughs> there you have it. We're on our way. Yom Kippur is coming. For everyone who's fasting, have an easy fast, and to be continued. Greetings, it's um, Tuesday, November 29th, uh, in the morning, and um, proceeding up on the left side of the mosaic frame, uh, the uh, where the Muscovy duck is. And this is really tricky, because, uh, well, right... Well, there's the body of the duck. The head is under there somewhere. And I really slathered on the uh, grout white in this area. It was uh, brown over here. And it goes into the white with the uh, body of the duck uh, down in the corner. But I really slathered this on here to get into all the cracks and crevices. So the tricky part is, is it's really hard to remove this from certain type of surfaces, like certain stones and rocks, uh, detritus, as uh, Reiner put it. Um, and uh, so I have to uh, work really fast now to see if I can clean off as much as I can, but at the same time, not pull out grout um, in any depth at all from between different uh, stones, rocks, tiles, uh, pieces of glass, and so on. So uh, we'll see how I do here. A bit more light. 
So, uh, and uh, maybe I'll give a report this afternoon or this evening, see how I did. Well, it has to dry, even after I clean some of the surface, it has to dry enough sufficiently so it isn't also pulling out with a damp sponge at the point when I go in with the dental tools. Okay. You were saying about uh, some parts of the uh, mosaic here that you find. There are uh, some, yeah, there are some pieces that are really ugly and, and uh, startlingly so, in contrast to the beauty of the mosaic mm -hmm. and the drama of the suffering in the middle. And I think that those are pieces of the reality behind um, uh, w that was part of the suffering. And I think it's important to have those in a way that. They're visible and in contrast to the beauty that somehow the art as a piece gives mm -hmm. us hope that we can see something mm -hmm. in a way that will move us forward and away from mm -hmm. what has happened here. Uh -huh. uh, but I think we have to name that and uh, hmm. in order to say goodbye to it, we uh -huh. have to name it. Right. Yeah. I guess that's interesting. You're the first person to address this in this uh, piece in progress. But for me, the the uh, inclusion of this um, of this kind of ugly metal hardware uh, from British Army stuff, uh, there's a, uh, the ore, there's um, a few pieces of things from the old uh, music hall theater, uh, uh -huh. like the um, uh -huh. piece down in the corner there, and uh, this black one up here. Well, having this kind of ugly dark metal stuff fits in when I look at these black and white photographs of someone like this man lying on the ground. Yeah. I don't know what time of year it was. Well, it wasn't snow, but it, you know, it's 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 cold, it's cool, it's it's dark. Um lying on the ground wearing his prayer shawl, mm -hmm. under barbed wire. Mm -hmm. It's 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 um the whole thing is brutal to me. Brutal. Yeah. And um so I guess maybe in my subconscious I'm blending what those type of photographs evoke for me in terms of the cold mechanics of the genocide and the killing and the uh, people being herded off and put into ghetto concentration camps and then sent off to concentration and death camps and the beauty of what I'm doing in the areas around. No, anyway, I, yeah, yeah, I think that's that's exactly the uh -huh. way it should be. And the, uh -huh. the fact that these pieces are ugly mm -hmm. uh, is a, an exact representation of the horror that mm -hmm. was going on as a part of the suffering. Uh -huh. And I think without them, uh, we don't see the depth of it, maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's part of the importance of your work, not just with this one, but all the mosaics, things like Ellie's Sin and, and uh -huh. so forth. I mean, mm -hmm. that's... Uh, hmm. Thanks, yeah. Don. Yeah.
of like uh, archaeology here. When I was a boy, I uh, daydreamed about becoming an archaeologist. I'm glad I didn't. This is like really laborious, tedious work. And how many archaeologists achieve uh, fame? You know, like uh, guys who uh, found uh, Tutank Tutank Amun. <laughs> uh, greetings, it is uh, December 14th, 2011. <laughs> Excuse me while I uh, didn't, uh, I'm using my human vacuum cleaner here to clear some uh, uh, grit off the uh, surface. But I wanted to uh, mention that uh, I've decided to leave some sections. Uh, without completely cleaning off all the grout. I did this in one section in the uh, lower right of the second mosaic drawing, the one called Life and Death in the Ghetto, uh, which is all wrapped here right now, but this section, the bottom, you can see through here where I, I left this, a grout on a section of uh, tiles there. And on uh, this work, um, I did a, a little of that in the left center, uh, in the area around where the uh, barbed wire line is on the drawing, which uh, in the drawing it's kind of right below his head, uh, and uh, near where his armpits would be anatomically in terms of how he's uh, the human body is constructed where I've got this um, uh, old uh, can opener detritus I picked up on the beach in Haifa a few years ago leading onto this uh, old uh, rowboat uh, anchor lock uh, and the section below that would be here and above I uh, left a lot of uh, grout intentionally and I've done the same with the talit section in the center top, which is above where the man's head is. And walking around in the, the whole upper right, I've done the same thing, including uh, in and around where the uh, mosaic is. I've, the, the look of it, with, particularly with the type of grout I bought, which is uh, called alabaster, on the package labeling reminds me of sand and sand has uh, at least a couple of meanings that come to mind immediately one is uh, ancient Israel and Palestine in the biblical era and so on modern Israel and Palestine are it's a very sandy country let me tell you there's no shortage of sand uh, in the area and uh, Gaza Israel the West Bank and so on um, and I continued that uh, without cleaning everything off entirely through the center right here above where the uh, glass is that holds the uh, barbed wire. So um, it's meant to give it a certain look. It also brings to mind for me, um, you know, they say, they say, we say, uh, we come, come from ashes and we turn to ashes. And uh, it also makes it brings to mind one of my uh, um, there's a number of passages in this book which I'm very very fond of. It's called Harry James Cargus in conversation with Elie Wiesel. Cargus is a late Catholic teacher and he interviewed uh, Wiesel. The book was published by Paulus Press, a Catholic press, in 1975 in the States. And uh, they're going to read you two short excerpts here on Wiesel on tears and on clouds which is interesting, especially to me, since so many um, victims of the Nazis who were gassed were then incinerated, uh, their bodies, and they went up in, in, uh, you know, in smoke out of these chimneys. Um, Wiesel says, clouds are not really a symbol, because when I speak of tears, I really mean tears. 
There were so many that were not shed they could have filled the entire universe and provoked another deluge. Which is uh, an interesting uh, uh, analogy there. I assume what he means by deluge is, is he's talking about the, the flood of the, uh, the Hebrew, Hebrew scriptures in the uh, Christian Bible as well. What they call, uh, Christians call the uh, Old Testament, we call Torah. Uh, Wiesel continues, clouds are symbols, especially in, and he's referring to his book called The Gates of the Forest, I see in the clouds all those Jews who left and returned, the only way for them to return was in clouds. For the first time in history, so many victims perished and had no cemeteries. Even the cemeteries were locked from them, from us. Heaven became their cemetery, which uh, is a good metaphor for me in terms of the 20 years I've been working now on the Under the Wings of God series, because I'm depicting people metaphorically, people who were murdered in real life, uh, in, in clouds, in a way, in the depiction I've done with, in so many of the works in the Under the Wings series with wings. So he continues, Heaven became their cemetery. The clouds became their cemetery. In a weird, strange way, it is symbolic too because cemeteries are impure and, and as Jews we should not dwell in cemeteries. So there's uh, there you have it, something to think about and uh, I'll have some more uh, footage.